At the dawn of the 16th century, the Earth was cooling down. This period of global cooling was most likely caused by volcanic eruptions, shifts in oceanic currents, and orbital fluctuation. European rivers froze, and famines struck all over Asia. But in the 1600s, global temperatures dropped even further. And this time, it was caused by humans. Specifically, it was driven by the settler colonial violence that tore through the lives of millions of people indigenous to what we now call North America. The Great Dying. A genocide that killed 90% of the estimated 60.5 million indigenous peoples on the continent. The land-grabbing pursuits of American colonists killed 56 million people, with numbers possibly even higher. This genocide was so massive that it led to a decrease of global atmospheric carbon levels by 3.5 parts per million, enough to lower temperatures across the world. But this is just the start of the United States' role in changing the climate. The country has a long and dark legacy tied to climate change that continues to this day. This is the story of how the United States caused and is still causing climate change. This video was made possible by the people who support me on Patreon. Get early access to all my videos by becoming an OCC Patreon supporter. When it comes to emissions, the United States is the undisputed champ. America is the largest historical emitter. Its cumulative emissions are almost double that of China's, a fact which often gets lost in comparisons of the two countries' current emission rates. Yes, China is emitting more right now. But keep in mind that a lot of Chinese industrial pollution is driven by demand from the United States. There are also four times as many people using energy in China than in the United States. And because CO2 lingers in the atmosphere for up to 200 years, cumulative emissions are a much more effective tool to understand who is driving climate change. And it's undeniably the United States. Not only did the US nurture the oil industry into existence with tax credits, technological advancements, and ravenous capitalist consumption, but it's done so again with the natural gas industry in the early 2000s, helping to lock in a new form of fossil fuels for decades to come with extensive pipeline construction and government subsidies. In part, this was to quench America's insatiable thirst for fossil fuels and material goods. The US has one of the highest CO2 emissions rates per capita in the world, a rate that is almost three times the global average. And the United States is the biggest producer and consumer of natural gas and oil, as well as home to the second largest fleet of coal factories. In short, the United States is responsible for an overwhelming share of cumulative emissions and is still sheltering fossil fuel industries that are at the root of the climate crisis. Yes, the United States has now committed to a 50 to 52% reduction of carbon emissions by 2030, which is certainly ambitious. But according to Climate Action Tracker, this reduction still falls almost 11 percentage points short of the emissions cuts needed to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. U.S. electricity consumption and overall emissions levels are dropping, but slowly. It's also the second biggest country in terms of renewable capacity, and infrastructure for clean energy does seem to be growing. But again, it's still too slow. Considering the 40 plus years of relative inaction since expert climate scientists warned of the threat of global warming, it's hard to imagine the United States cutting their emissions in half over the next nine years. Politicians like Democrat Joe Manchin, who are firmly in the pocket of big oil companies. Joe Manchin, I talk to his office every week. Um, he is the kingmaker. And the 130 members of Congress who deny or doubt that the climate crisis even exists continue to resist any of the actions necessary to reverse course, especially any climate action that might hinder a giant corporation's ability to make money by exploiting workers and natural resources. In short, before it even reaches its tentacles across the world, the American empire is responsible for far more than its fair share of emissions. And like its refusal to recognize its violent exploitation abroad, as we'll see shortly, the ruling class of the United States refuses to recognize the harm caused by our use of fossil fuels as long as burning them is quote unquote good for the economy 
as in good for shareholders and executives at major fossil fuel corporations. In order to fuel its excessive capitalist need to produce and accumulate goods, the United States has built an empire. One that stretches across the world in the form of nearly 800 military bases in 80 countries. Every year, the federal government sets aside nearly half of its discretionary budget, some $778 billion in 2020, for military spending. Some in the US view this gargantuan fighting force as a spreader of democracy and as the world's police force. And in a way, they're right. The US military does act as the police force of the world. Because, like the police, the US military ruthlessly safeguards the interests of capitalist multinationals and the state at the expense of the poor and people of color. This is best exemplified in the slew of coups, wars, and military interventions that have carved out American control of foreign oil fields. From the US-backed Iranian coup to the Carter Doctrine in the 1980s that explicitly committed the United States to defend the oil fields of the Persian Gulf against external threats, to the Gulf War, to the Iraq War, and to the two failed Venezuelan coups trying to topple presidents nationalizing oil reserves, the list goes on. Not only do these imperialist attacks secure and subsidize the future of oil use in a time when we need to be doing the exact opposite, but they also destabilize regions so that they're even more vulnerable to the catastrophes made more extreme by the climate crisis. Iraq has been experiencing this reality firsthand. After almost 40 years of US-fueled conflicts, the people and landscapes of Iraq are bruised. Wetlands along the Tigris and Euphrates were purposefully drained in the 1990s as a method of retaliation against communities reliant on their biodiverse ecosystems. So by 2001, 90% of Iraqi marshlands disappeared. And provisional governments that have failed to provide robust support to the Iraqi people Decimated infrastructure and schools have all made recovering from a multi-decade war much harder. And the climate crisis has just made that recovery even harder. Increased heat in Iraq means increased dust storms and less arable lands. In Fao, arable land has decreased from 7.5 square kilometers to 3.7 square kilometers. While in Tikar, it has dropped from 100 square kilometers to just 12.5 square kilometers. Which means that Iraqi farmers who've tended to the land for generations are now being forced to find some other means of subsistence. The جفاف عن هذا المناطق يعني بمسافات كبيرة جدا لذلك تشوف حتى إنه صارت هجرة. In short, adapting to climate chaos is already difficult for those on the front lines. But the U.S. has made it even harder by selfishly scorching the region in fire and fury to protect their oil interests. So, in a cruel twist of the knife, the U.S. not only makes adapting to climate change more difficult in the regions they exploit, but they're the very ones fueling the fires of the climate crisis. Indeed, the Department of Defense is the single largest consumer of oil in the world. It has a bigger footprint than 140 countries. But military violence isn't the only tool the United States has used in its efforts to control global markets. Alongside the United States' military exploits, US-backed sanctions are wreaking havoc across the globe. War and sanctions are the one-two punch of US imperialism. Together, they work to bully any dissident or leftist governments from straying far from the United States' neoliberal agenda of material and labor exploitation of the global south to fuel the luxuries of the global north. U.S.-backed economic sanctions impact nearly one-third of humanity in some 30 countries, and essentially work to starve countries into submission. In a world now experiencing an increasing number of crises, this is unethical and unjust. Guns and missiles might not be present, but sanctions still kill. In Cuba, COVID-19 has been exacerbated by the tightening of economic sanctions under the Trump regime. While in Yemen, under a US-backed Saudi blockade, over 20 million people are suffering from food insecurity, with 50,000 children dying of starvation in 2017. This in a country expected to experience more climate change-driven droughts and heat waves. 
To compound the harm, the U.S. is reluctant to shelter refugees or migrants. So while the U.S. continues to pour carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and heat up the planet, it's simultaneously tearing away the ability of countries on the front lines of climate chaos to deal with catastrophes. And then it's closing its eyes to the consequences. In order to truly face the climate crisis, then, we must forge an anti-imperialist agenda. At the 2009 Conference of Parties in Copenhagen, otherwise known as COP15, the world was on the brink of a preliminary form of climate agreement when Bolivia, Venezuela, Tuvalu, Sudan, and a few other countries refused to sign on. Their reason? Imperialist powers like the US and the European Union rejected the notion that they should own up to their climate debt a term that calls for reparations for the hundreds of years of emissions and colonial violence doled out by the global north onto the global south. Despite backlash, Bolivia and its comrades were right. Any effective climate agenda must incorporate the repair that comes with paying off the climate debt. The US not only must end its imperialist interventions, but do the opposite and aid countries in no strings attached funding of renewable and technological revolutions led by the global south as a means to escape reliance on fossil fuels. But repairing the harm of centuries of American imperialism doesn't stop there. It also means significant demilitarization of the US US war machine while simultaneously sheltering the growing population of refugees fleeing the climate crisis. Ultimately, the United States has been at the front lines of digging the world into a deep hole of climate chaos. So in order to repair the damage it's done, the US not only needs to stop digging, but turn its resources towards building a ladder so that we might all escape the worst of climate catastrophe. Unfortunately, videos like these, while very important, do terribly with the YouTube algorithm and sponsors don't want to touch them. But there is a way you can help. Becoming an OCC Patreon supporter helps our changing climate stay afloat and independent. As an OCC patron, you'll not only gain early access to videos, but also special behind the scenes updates and a members only Discord channel. In addition, each month, my supporters vote on an environmental group that I then donate a portion of my monthly revenue to. Patreon supporters are the financial backbone of the Our Changing Climate operation. Without them, I wouldn't be able to take creative risks and dive into difficult topics. So if you want to help keep this channel alive or are feeling generous, head over to patreon.com slash rchangingclimate or use the link in the description and become an OCC patron. If you're not interested or aren't financially able to, then no worries. You can help the channel out by subscribing, liking the video, and commenting. I hope you all enjoyed the video and I will see you in two weeks.